Good morning, church. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? Oh, I heard one good. At least one person's doing good. That's good. That's good to hear. Well, we're here this morning to worship the Lord, and we serve a God who is eternal, from everlasting to everlasting, the God of, of all ages, the ancient of days. He is the everlasting God. And so we're going to stand and sing right now, and, and oh, and Pastor uh, has this, hold them up right now. We have handouts at the front, so if you didn't get those handouts, uh, make sure that you you can go grab one now. I think we have announcements and sermon notes on those, so those are for everybody. Be sure and grab a handout on your way in, or head back there and grab one. And we're going to sing right now. If everyone would stand and sing with me, we're going to worship the everlasting God today. Lord, I pray for comfort for them. 
We have many who are coming today. Maybe they're a little sore from working yesterday and laboring for you. I pray you renew their strength. Amen. Lord, for those that are facing illnesses and diseases and challenges and just uncertainty, help them to know that you are right there and you are comforting them. We thank you, Lord. I pray you prepare our hearts to worship you today as we look at how you have given us the great comforter, the triune God, the Holy Spirit. We thank you for that. I pray now that this blessing upon all that is done, may we bring glory and honor to Jesus and lift you up and worship you, Father, through the Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Seated. Good morning, everybody. Welcome. Morning. Uh, I hope that you took a chance to look at the uh, Education and Fellowship Hall building. It looks beautiful. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank you, everyone, who came out. And uh, we had a lot of people come out and did prep work during the week. Uh, so those of you that did prep work came out between Monday and, and sat, uh, Friday. Kind of just great. Raise your hand. Hey, Orville, I know you were here. You were digging the long right side of me, Orville. So way, way, yeah, hi, Orville. He's like, I'm over there. <laughs> so, all right, so those are prep people, hey? And then for those of you that came out yesterday, why don't you give a big wave to everybody? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really going to call out all the names, but uh, so if I miss you, I apologize. But yesterday I was told we had Clyde and Kathy Miller, Cameron, Keith, Deanna, Adam, Andrew, Tito, Alma, Lizzie, Jan, Jim, Rachel, and lunch provided by the Booker. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> if you provided something I didn't mention, it's because I didn't get it on the list. So, uh, but I've had a couple people ask me about. Uh, they would love to donate a gallon of paint or five gallons of paint. Basically, our paint came out to about thirty-eight dollars per gallon. So if you would like to donate whatever, that is what it is. That can go into our building fund. But it's got a great price on the paint. Came out about $37, $38. And we are excited. And the Spanish church informed me today that if we buy the paint, they'll paint our sidewalks. Woo! <laughs> they'll the labor. Uh, so uh, it's exciting to have all those things done. And uh, we're just glad that you were here. If this is your first time here, first time off, please fill out a visitor's card. Let us know that you were here today. And we're going to continue in worship and praise. And those of you that worked with your hands to the paint, stretch them out to God today. It's okay. You just need to work those muscles. Some of you bent down low, and that may hurt a little, but, you know, it's all for the glory of God. Amen? Amen. So let's talk about the spirit of the living God. Let's sing. Amen. Amen, amen. And you know, it looks so good now that that building has a, a new fresh coat of paint and it's all shiny and nice looking. And uh, you know, that that's what happens to us when we invite the Holy Spirit into our life. Amen. He gives our soul a fresh coat of paint. He gives us a, a redo, a makeover. And we're going to be singing today about the Holy Spirit of God. And we just want to invite his presence here today. If you came here today, that means the Spirit of God has work to do with you. He wants to show up. He wants to, to convict you and comfort you and move into your life. So let's stand and sing right now in 389, Spirit of the Living God.
Amen. And we believe that the God casts out fear. We were not given a spirit of fear, the Bible says. So when we have the Holy Spirit, all fear ceases, all anxiety ceases. We have his joy and his peace and his comfort. Amen. And that spirit is here today. If you'll, you'll flip to him, 391, sweet, sweet spirit. Yes. There's a sweet spirit in this place this morning. So let's sing it. Thank you. 
Share with the community, share with friends, share with enemies. Be with our pastor that he shares how we believe and what we believe. Amen. May it be evident in our life each day of our lives as we go through this day, and this week, and this year, and months ahead. Yes. May we take up this offering. That is also part of your work for us. Yes. It's part of worship and why we're here as well. May we do what you have us to do. May your money go spread further than you can ever imagine. And I thank you for your love for my family and me, this church. Continue to protect our pastor and his wife. Watch over them. Amen. Keep them safe in your arms. In your name I pray. Amen. 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 We're going to sing one more song to the Lord. And, um, this is a song just inviting the Holy Spirit. And I've seen it on, on your faces and heard it in your voices that y'all have encountered God today in worship. Amen. You have felt his presence. Amen. If there's anyone out there that hasn't felt his presence, that doesn't feel like you really got your heart right and invited him in, I would just encourage you during this song to just do exactly what this song says and tell the Lord, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. We want him to just completely fill our lives. We don't just want a little bit of the Holy Spirit. We want the full thing. We want all of him. And the way that we get all of him is by giving him all of us. So let's give him our all right now as we sing this song. <laughs> There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're a living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. Of the sweetest of love, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Oh, your presence, Lord. Oh, oh. 
I'm not going to read every one of them, so I wanted you to take this home and you can look up for yourselves in your Bible and look at all these verses. And so that's why I printed that out today, that you could have that, because I know some of you would be like, I can't keep up with writing all that down. Uh, Karen's already freaking out. She's got to keep up with the slides, but it's on print. So you have that and you can see that today. And uh, just before we get going with that, uh, just want to thank again everybody that came out and labored this week. I had the privilege yesterday of doing an incredible uh, honoring gift to me. Uh, many of you may remember years ago, it's been probably 25, 28 plus years ago, a young gentleman was a member of our church named Mel Garcia. He uh, was in my youth group at North Rome. Uh, when Darlene and I joined here, he started coming here, and he uh, was in the youth group, went, uh, worked at our Awana ministry, taught with our kids. I uh, did remember his first time ever preaching from the pulpit. I thought some of you were going to pass out, and he opened it up saying, uh, Dear Dad. And, and it just that affection that he loved his Heavenly Father so much, he called him Dad. But... Uh, got the privilege yesterday to be on his ordination council and to be able to grill him and question him on his theology, hear a lot about him, talk to him, and be there and uh, just be a part to lay hands on him and ordain him. Uh, he is the pastor of First Baptist Church of Ridge Manor, and uh, so it is exciting. And uh, so just it was a blessing to kind of go full circle to realize I was one that knew him the longest, 33 years. <laughs> Remember uh, my first trip as a youth pastor, Ryan, this is not advice to follow. <laughs> Anybody ever driven on Interstate 10? Yes. Anybody realize how many, how few gas stations there are on Interstate 10? Well, I made the mistake of borrowing a church member's van that didn't know how their gas gauge worked. And then we were on Interstate 10 in the middle of nowhere, and we ran out of gas. Being a young 25-year-old youth director, not knowing any better, I said, okay, kids, get out and push. So here are the teenagers were pushing the van down the interstate as I'm staring. And they were singing praise songs to the Lord. We are having a great time. Then I realized this probably isn't too safe. We need to flag somebody down and go get gas. So, uh, that, so check the gas gauge. Don't get on I-10 without knowing uh, where the gas stations are. Yes. If you borrow somebody's van, ask them if the gas gauge works. Uh, because that was a surprise. Uh, so, but being able to kind of share that with uh, Noel yesterday and, and just encourage him and ministry and see that uh, what we believe, and one of the things that was exciting yesterday is we were, the Ordination Council was going, we talked about what makes you a Southern Baptist, and he's answering some questions, and they said, okay, that, that made you a Baptist, now what makes you a Southern Baptist, and talked to him about what he believes, and one of the questions that was posed to him was, what do you believe about the Holy Spirit, and I said, oh good, I'm going to take notes, because I'm preaching on that tomorrow. <laughs> And, but it was great to see that here these pastors came together in a common thing that we, number one, we believe the word of God. Amen. It is what we base everything on. And we choose to partner with and be in cooperation with the Southern Baptist Convention. And we follow uh, and support something called the Baptist Faith and Message. And what is so good is I mentioned that Orville showed me just all through this book, it doesn't talk about being Southern Baptist. It talks about the Bible, because that's what we are. We believe in the Bible. And so that's why I want to make sure today when you have this handout, it has all the scripture references of what we believe, how we believe, especially in the thing where, you know, we see some people that maybe risk, misrepresent teachings of the Holy Spirit, and there's a lot going on. There's a lot in the news about some denominations and what they do and how they're things that are going on and uh, just want to encourage you that we need to stay true to God's word and stay faithful to it. So let's open up in prayer. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. I pray right now your Holy Spirit does fill this place. I pray that you would speak through me, speak to us, 
and challenge us, Heavenly Father, with the, your spirit and the wonderful grace that we get through Jesus Christ to come into this place. Teach us, challenge us, stir us, convict us. And I pray that if anyone here today doesn't know for sure where they're going to spend eternity in heaven or not, that, that today would be a day of salvation. That your spirit would move. And we thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So as we see, our opening scripture talks about Ephesians 5.18. It says, and don't get drunk with wine. Okay, I'm not preaching on that part of that. Okay, I'll be like, oh, shh. skip the bullet on that one. Which leads to recklessness living, but that's true. But be filled with the Spirit. We want to talk about what that is. And when we talk about God, a lot of you have a picture of what God is. Some of you may picture him as some guy sitting up on the throne that's sitting there watching every move you make and he's ready to throw a lightning bolt down at you and punish you and you think if you make one mistake he's going to just be mad at you forever. And then a lot of us have pictures of what Jesus is. You may picture him on the cross. You may picture him coming out of the grave. You may picture him feeding the 5,000. But when I say Holy Spirit, there's not much we can get in our mind. What would picture? A dove? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Wind? Um, so we don't have this thing in, in Baptist churches. Like I said, sometimes we've gotten scared of the, the Holy Spirit and what that means. And uh, we want to look at this as we continue with the What We Believe series, looking at the third message here on God. We want to concentrate on the doctrine of God and the Holy Spirit. Uh, fancy uh, term, pneumatology, literally you know, a word about the Spirit. And I want to start off by reading what is in our uh, Baptist faith and message. We're going to have it up on the screen. And as if you can follow along, uh, God, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, fully divine. He is inspired. He inspired holy men of old to write the scriptures through illumination. He enables men to understand truth. He exalts Christ. He convicts men of sin, of righteousness and of judgment. He calls men to the Savior and affects regeneration. At the moment of regeneration, he baptizes every believer into the body of Christ. He cultivates Christian character, comforts believers, and bestows the spiritual gifts by which we serve through his church. He seals the believer unto the day of final redemption. His presence in the Christian is the guarantee that God will bring the believer into the fullness of the stature of Christ. He enlightens and empowers the believer and the church in worship, evangelism, and service. So that's what it says in the Baptist faith and message, but we're going to look at what God says in the Bible today about those things. And we see that uh, while we know a lot about Jesus, we have lots of stories about him, we love reading about those things. We come today and we sing songs, and uh, Ryan and I were like, okay, there's not a lot of songs that we know about the spirit because but we have some there we sing about that we do want to invite him to this place and we're going to look today at who he is and what he is and uh and talk about that and since the holy spirit is fully god we can't cover everything today uh it would be impossible for us to do that just like i couldn't cover everything there is about god or jesus we're going to just hit some of the highlights today and what we're going to see is looking at how he's the about the person and nature of the Holy Spirit. From there, we're going to cover the major activities outlined for us in Scripture, and then we'll consider how we're supposed to respond. Yeah. What do we do with Him? So looking, number one, the person uh, and nature of the Holy Spirit. We see here that our confessional statement sets this sentence. It says, the Holy Spirit of God is the Spirit of God fully divine. He is equal, and He is the triune God, and I know that can be confusing. Somebody's like, well, what does that mean? How can he be three in one? I don't get it. And the other thing I want you to realize is he possesses all the attributes and characters of God, because he is God. He is omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, and holy life. What are all those? That means he knows everything, he is everywhere, and he is all-powerful. So he is eternal, immutable, righteous, just, and loving, and is the third person of the Trinity. He is a person. He is not an it. Got that? Yep. It's not an it. Amen. It is a he. He is a person. He has personality traits. And many people break that mistake of referring to him as the it. And we look in uh, first uh, in John 14, 26. This verse I chose to use the New King James Version. It uses the masculine personal program where it says, But the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. 
Remember, our understanding is God is He is a triune God. He is, expresses Himself in three equal parts, but unique persons. The personhood of God, the personhood of Jesus, the personhood of the Holy Spirit. And we see that the Holy Spirit is that third person in the triune Godhead. He's not some little force like the Jehovah's Witnesses believe. He's not simply uh, Jesus or God the Father appearing in a different mode as some heresies teach. The Holy Spirit is a unique person of the, and has divine characteristics. So we can fellowship with him. We can have a relationship with him. He is there. And because of that, we can come and realize that he can come and tell us things. We can invite him to be present and he can give us uh, encouragement and he can bring us retribution and let us know some things. Acts 5, 3 tells us that it's possible to lie to him. We can lie to the Holy Spirit. And Acts 7, 51 tells us it's possible to resist him. Acts 13, 2 tells us that he speaks. All of those are characteristics of a person. And we, we study the Bible in the very beginning. We see that he was there in Genesis 1, 2. It says, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surfaces of the water. He was there in Genesis. But he's also there in Revelation. When we see at the end, it says in Revelation 22, 17, both the Spirit and the bride say, come. Anyone who hears should say, come. And the one who is thirsty should come. Whoever desires should take the living water as a gift. He was active in the Old Testament. He's active in the New Testament. At Pentecost, which Pentecost Sunday is next Sunday, he came and uh, to the people. And the first time when God and Jesus said, I will send one. He sent him on the day of Pentecost and things changed. And we had that incredible thing. So we see here, he is real. He is a person. But point two now we're look at, we know he's a person in nature. We're going to see the work of the Holy Spirit. What does he do? You say, well, I have no idea. I don't understand. It scares me. Well, let's look at what he does today. He, uh, we come to see that the work of the Holy Spirit is to manifest the active presence of God in the world. He's there to help us. He's there to encourage us. And we see first that one of these things we're looked at, he is the spirit of revelation. The Bible was written by men, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit guided him. And people say, well, the Bible's full of mistakes. Do you think if God could put the whole universe together, he could figure out, make sure this didn't get a mistake in it? Amen. That blows my mind. Amen. Oh, I believe in God. I believe he created everything. But, you know, his work got some mistakes. You don't think he can figure that out? He's God. He inspired those men. He told those men, this is, write this down. And if they got it wrong, I'm sure he went, eh, eh, eh. <laughs> fix that. Amen. You know, the Holy Spirit was there giving a spirit of revelation. 2 Peter 2, uh, 2 Peter 1, 21 assures us because no prophecy ever came by the will of man. Instead, men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit inspired scripture. We have to realize that it is God's love letter to us, given through the Spirit to man to write down for us to be able to read. It is the work of the Holy Spirit who gives revelation. So we also see he brings conviction. We don't like that one. We don't say, okay, Holy Spirit, we don't need to work on that one. You can just hold off. But John 6, 16, 8 says, tells us that the Holy Spirit convicts the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. But interesting, it carries the idea of reconciliation. The Holy Spirit's not there just to keep telling you everything you did wrong. He's to reconcile and help you to get better. He's there to help you and reconcile you. God, the Holy Spirit, reveals our sins and convicts us and shows us how we're unrighteous, but then also tells us and warns us of a coming judgment that he loves us and wants us to be in fellowship with God, the Father. So we have that. He brings conviction. He extends an invitation. Point C, it talks about that we have known the Holy Spirit is actively involved in inviting people to come to know Christ. It is through the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, that people are able to see their sin for what it is. We are sinners. Without the work of the Holy Spirit, none of the world can come to be a Christian. The Holy Spirit calls us and leads us. We see in Romans 3, 10 through 11, there is no one righteous, not even one. 
means nobody in here is good enough. Look around. None of us are good enough. But we see that there is no one that understands. There is no one who seeks God. It is the Holy Spirit who invites us to come. It's the Holy Spirit who enables us to see that we need a Savior. So it is the Holy Spirit that gives that invitation. You say, well, I accepted Jesus. Well, yes, you did. You received him. But the Holy Spirit called you first. We get caught up in this uh, term in the last few decades of seeker service. We should make our churches seeker friendly. Nobody really seeks after being good. We like doing bad things. It's more comfortable. It's the Holy Spirit that calls us and says, you need to be better. You need to do more. And then when he does that, we accept that invitation. He also affects regeneration. The Bible tells us the Holy Spirit regenerates us or makes us new in Christ. John 3, 5 through 6 tells us that Nicodemus, that he must be born again. He says, Jesus answered, I assure you, unless someone is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who gives us new life. He's the one that fills us and gives us that. The Bible tells us in Romans 8, 10, that the Holy Spirit brings life. He regenerates. We're so glad if you're a believer that you have the Holy Spirit right there to regenerate, to make you better. We talk about as we come to Jesus as we are, but he doesn't want to leave us that way. He gives us new life. He regenerates us. And he, he indwells the believers. He is there for us. Let's go to the next slide as he indwells the believer. Contrary to what some may teach, there's no second blessing where you have to beg and plead to get the Holy Spirit. There's churches that actually teach classes on how to get the Holy Spirit. You get the Holy Spirit the moment you say, Dear Jesus, forgive me, I'm a sinner, save me. Boom! I wish I could clap hard. <laughs> you get the Holy Spirit the moment you're saved. That's when you get the Holy Spirit. He is there. He is the one that is coming into us. He indwells us. Ephesians 1, 13 through 14 tells us that at the moment of salvation, God puts the Spirit into us and the seal of ownership. And then we have assurance that we are His and will never forsake us. Romans 8, 9 says, You, however, are not in flesh, but in spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Scripture tells us if we don't have the Holy Spirit, we're not saved. You say, well, I don't have the Holy Spirit. Well, guess what? You're then you're not saved. If you're saved, you have the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's a package deal. You don't pick and choose. It's not all apart. Well, I want a little bit of Jesus. No, I don't need the Holy Spirit stuff. And I want some God. No. You come to Christ, He takes all of you. And He changes us. That's a great thing. I love the fact that He took this wretched pastor and saved him and made him better. Am I perfect? By no means. Don't talk to Darlene about that. <laughs> I know I'm not perfect. But I'm forgiven. Amen. And I can be regenerated. And I can be restored. And I can be helped. And he is there and he helps us. In the moment I got saved is the moment I got the Holy Spirit. And you say, well, I don't feel him. We'll talk about that in a minute. But we see here he teaches us. He teaches believers. In John 14, 26, Jesus says the Holy Spirit will teach us all things and bring all things into remembrance whatsoever Christ has commanded us. Sometimes I wish he taught me to remember a little bit more. Um, but working on that. The Holy Spirit is a teacher. He shows this truth. When you open up the Bible and you say, wow, I never saw that before. Guess what happened? The Holy Spirit went, <clears throat> taught you something new. Okay? He is the teacher. He's the one that enables us to discern truth from falsehood. Guys, there's so much falsehood out there. There are so many things on the internet, and TikTok, and Instagram, and television. There's so many hype preachers telling people what they want to hear. There are so many motivational speaking pastors. Debate on whether you mention that. I'm watching the, the Secrets of Hillsong documentary. Wow. Y'all need to look at that. I, I didn't realize 
how far off these people were and what goes on. And to see the people come, and I, and I was telling the audience that we're listening to these people give testimony, and never do they talk about Jesus building their church or Jesus working or the Bible. It's all about the person on the platform and the music they do. And he talked about how he just loves to speak, and he does this, and he did that. And I'm like, wow. Comes out wearing a $5,000 leather jacket. $500 shoes. Tell the people they need Jesus. But then he entertains. But we need to see that the Holy Spirit there should help us discern the error and the falsehoods of those teachings. When you talk about feel-good theology, it lasts until you're not feeling good anymore. When you come to church, guys, Sometimes you should walk out going, ow, that hurt. Because the Bible should sit there and point out the things you need to work on. If I come in here and make you feel good all day, what did I get? If you go to, go to hell feeling good, what's the point? I need to say, sin is sin. Some of us are struggling with sin. Some of us need to change. Some of us need to repent. Some of us need to work on sin. The Holy Spirit saying, stop doing that. But we want to come in and be told, oh, just do this and God will bless you and you'll get all these wonderful things and you'll have to be rich and famous. I don't think Paul did too well on that. Uh, no. uh, what was it? The, I'm sorry, my mind just went left. <laughs> but Paul, he struggled. He didn't get all the, the prophets of uh, wealth and things. Prosperity gospel. Yeah. He wasn't teaching that. But anyway, got sidetracked. He teaches believers. The Holy Spirit will guide us. He will declare to what is to come. He helps us. Point G. He makes intercession. This is the great thing. This is what we should get excited about. He is there. The most reassuring ministry of the Holy Spirit is intercessions. Romans 8, 26 through 27. This is great. I hope you get this verse. It says, in the same way, the Spirit also joins the help in our weakness. Yes. Because we do not know what to pray or as we should. But the Spirit himself intercedes for us with unspoken groanings. And he who searches the hearts and the spirit, the mindset, because he intercedes for the saints in the will of God. He is there. When you don't know what to do, he's already interceding for you. It's saying we don't know. It doesn't say that we don't know what to pray. We don't know how to pray. What is it that God really wants? Because sometimes we get selfish in our prayers. God, I want this. The Holy Spirit says, no, God, he doesn't want that. He needs this. Amen. He intercedes. So sometimes you can say, God, I don't know what to say. Guess what? The Holy Spirit's already talking to the Father for you. He is there. He clearly is there. It says we do not need to know how to pray as we should, but God has made provisions for us. The Spirit intercedes. That gets. He goes before God on our behalf, asking God for what we need. And he makes intercession. Don't be afraid to say, Holy Spirit, intercede for me. Help me. I don't even know what to say. I'm facing this, Holy Spirit. Please intercede. Show me what I need, Amen. not what I want. Amen. He brings unity to his people. H, Ephesians 4, 3. He commands us to be diligent, preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. While in Philippians 1, 27 tells us to be steadfast in one spirit. In 2 uh, Corinthians 13, 14, it speaks of the unifying fellowship of the Holy Spirit for all believers when it mentions fellowship of the Spirit. The idea here is that through the Spirit is the dwelling of people, there's going to be unity in, uh, unity in the body. You ever notice that when you're out in public, sometimes you connect with some people? It's because you have a common spirit. The Holy Spirit's like, man, you're a believer. You sense that. And just because we worship in one church doesn't mean that we can't have fellowship with other believers. Amen. And we should have fellowship with people within the church. Amen. There should be unity. And sometimes we're going to disagree. Some of you may came in today and went, I didn't like the paint. <laughs> Those of you that didn't like it, we have prank brushes for you. <laughs> So those of you who walk out and say they missed a spot, we have paint brushes for you too. <laughs> those of you who say, well, they drip, drip there, we have paint remover for you. 
Let's be unified. I am. We need to come together and worship together. We're not going to agree on everything. And that's okay. But we better believe, can't hit it up, it's my wrist. We better believe this. We need to be unified in what the Bible says. We can have some differences of opinions on some other things, but we come together to worship. And we see that the Holy Spirit lets us do that. He brings us together. He also empowers God's people for service. Acts 1 8. Had to memorize this and learn this uh, back in Bible college. You know, get, receive the Holy Spirit. He gives us that power. He told the disciples there that we would receive a special anointing of power. It enables us to carry the work of God. We can go into Jerusalem, G, and the other parts of the world. We have the Holy Spirit there. He gives us the strength. In Zechariah 4, 6, he said, Not by strength or might, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Jesus said that without him, we can do nothing, which is to say without his spirit working in, in us and through us, or without the supernatural power which he alone can give, we cannot accomplish anything that it has eternal consequences. The Holy Spirit gives you the power. When you say, I'm too scared to talk to that person about Jesus. Say, Holy Spirit, help. Give me the power. He equips the believers with spiritual gifts. There's a lot of verses there I want you to look at today when you get home. 1 Corinthians 12, there's a whole long chapter once you read through that. Romans 12, 6-8, and 1 Peter 4, 10-11. I'm not going to take time to read those today, but I want you to look at those. It tells us the Holy Spirit gives spiritual gifts for every believer to equip them to be a functional, productive part of the body. That's what your gifts are for, is to build up God's kingdom, not build up yourself. Some people get caught up in a gift that edifies himself. It's to bring glory to God. We see now every believer has a spiritual gift. The obvious question is, is why aren't we using them? So pastor, I don't know what mine is. You probably know what it is. You're just afraid of it. The problem is, you see, it's not with the spirit uh, who gives the gifts, but it's with the believer who has buried their talent instead of investing the life and the work of the kingdom of God. The church will grow or diminish based on the active work of the Holy Spirit as he flows through people, people of God, to accomplish the will of God. The Holy Spirit is giving you gifts, talents, and abilities. Are you using them? For his glory. There's a catch there. You're using it for his glory. He gives you those things. Now we need to understand the work of the Holy Spirit. Let's talk for a moment about our response. You know, he is there to give us those gifts, to help us, to establish us, to do those things. And we need to come and realize that we respond and interact. So what is our response to the Holy Spirit? You can go to the next slide there. Our response, uh, he whips us and we see our response. We are to be able to fellowship with him. We are to be there. Philippians 2.1. If then are any encouragement in Christ, if any consolation of love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, any affection and mercy... Being in fellowship with the Holy Spirit means walking in fellowship with God. He is there to give us fellowship. You have an awareness. When's the last time you were aware of God's presence in you? Sometimes that's a little scary if we really stop thinking. You're truly aware that God's presence is so real and so powerful, so vivid, that you can feel or sense his presence. Now, I'm not talking about feelings here. But we're to act, not act like we don't have any feeling. But when's the last time you said, wow, I sense God's presence. I feel him moving in this. Or yeah, I move him telling me in this. I remember some of the times, one time I was praying so much that I literally, you say, oh, pastor, you're getting a little Pentecostal on me. I was praying so much, I literally felt like I was spinning. I was like, man, I... It only happened a couple of times where I was so deep in prayer, I was just like, man, I never felt anything. I'd say, well, you know, Pastor, you're just delirious. Maybe your blood sugar dropped. I don't know. <laughs> Other time I was in a place and I sensed evilness. Amen. That was the Holy Spirit saying, get yourself out of there. Amen. I was in a place and I was like, there's a darkness here. There's an evilness here. I didn't have to be afraid of it. But God didn't want me around it. And the Holy Spirit said, time to go now. 
So don't be afraid. Be aware that he is there. Cognitively, we know the Spirit's with us. The Bible tells us it's with us. We can live with assurance he's there. We need to realize that he is there to help us. He is personally with you. That old hymn that talks about him, he walks with me and he talks with me and tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Romans says the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, joy, and the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. We are to enjoy his presence. Do you enjoy hanging out with people you love? I hope so. You should enjoy the people you love. Do you enjoy spending time with the Holy Spirit? We should realize that we spend time with him. We need to come and spend time with the presence of God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. He is attentive. He is there. He is, not only should we be aware, we need to be, he is attentive to his voice. Sometimes we can hear him whispering. Maybe he's talking to you through other people, through his word. He is there. He needs, the reason a lot of you don't say, or you tell me, I don't know what God says, I don't hear him, is we got too busy not listening. We're so busy doing things, and some things are good things. But maybe he just wants us to stop and be still and know that he's God. We have all these other voices coming at you. The TV, the radio, social media. Maybe we just need to pause, be still, and say, okay, God, speak. We come in and we blurt out our prayer request, rattle off everything. Okay, God, tell me what to do. Amen. I and you stick off. You don't wait for the answer. He said there went, I was ready to tell you, but you got up and left. We need to realize, stay in fellowship, be attentive, listen for him. Wrong actions and attitudes will always come when you're not listening. 1 John 1, 6 and 7 says, If we say we have fellowship with him and we walk in darkness, we are lying and not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. <laughs> Hearing his voice, knowing that he is there, we are filled by him. Ephesians 5, 18 started off says and don't get drunk with wine which leads to reckless living but be filled with the spirit at the end of the day the spirit filled life is about surrender giving him your life it's about surrendering your him it's about giving up your agenda the i wants the i will lose your desires you totally depend on him to be filled with the spirit means you're not filled with yourself you trust him he is the one there. Major problem with many Christians is they're so filled with themselves that they're not filled enough with the Spirit of God. Want God to guide you? Give, let him have control. But we sit there and tell him what we want. Now, I want to clarify here that you're not getting more of God, but God is getting more of you. When you're talking about being filled with the Spirit, they used to say, well, it's because I leak. <laughs> I need to be refilled. <laughs> You have the Holy Spirit, but the problem is that you keep taking back control and you need to be filled with him by releasing control, letting him guide you, let him emptying ourselves, and let him permeate your heart, your mind and all your decisions. Let Christ fill you to guide you. Galatians 2, 19 and 20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live is in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loves me and gave himself for me. He is talking about the spirit-filled life. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants you to be filled. In Romans 8, 9 through 11 says, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in spirit, since the Spirit of God lives in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now Christ is in you. The body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, then you who are raised, raised Christ from the dead will also bring your mortal bodies to life through the spirit who lives in you. The seal, sealing and indwelling of the Holy Spirit is there. It's a one-time thing. You don't lose salvation. You can't lose the Holy Spirit. You can't lose what you didn't do anything to earn. 
It's a gift of God. Jesus died on the cross for you. He paid the price. And the Holy Spirit comes into your life and seals the deal. It's done. We need to realize we don't want to keep going back. We want to be released and give him the process. We're to produce his fruit. But the fruit of the Spirit is this in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. You have these. Love, joy, peace, kindness. Don't like that. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The law is not against such things. Now, I also want to say, it's not the fruits, plural, it's the fruit. You get all. Some of you just don't tap in too much. You can say, well, now, I personally don't like that P one there, that patience one. You know what happens? God keeps bringing things into my life to teach that to me. So, if you say, I want more patience, you pray for that, guess what's coming? Anybody ever prayed for patience? Anybody ever regretted paying for patience? Patience comes through trials. You want more patience? You're going to get more trials. So I ask for endurance. <laughs> Tomato, tomato, I know. But just, Lord, help me to endure it. Uh, but fruit trees don't have to decide to produce fruit. They do what they naturally do. And as Christians, we struggle to give him the ability to work through us and give us love, peace, joy, and patience. We need to come to Jesus and say, Holy Spirit, work in me. Change me. Fill me. Guide me. As our worship team comes up, I want you to think about where are you in your faith walk? If you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit already, period. You don't need to go take a class. You don't need to go to some churches that have classes on practicing certain gifts or demonstrating certain gifts. Or you don't, if you don't do this, you're not saved. That ain't it, guys. You have the Holy Spirit when you ask Jesus to come into your life. Boom. Now, are you surrendering to me? Are you listening to him? Now, that's a different story. He's there. He may just may not be listening. But if you've never come to the point where you've accepted Christ as your Savior, then you don't have him. He's that little voice that's saying, you need to change. You need Jesus. Listen to him. He wants you to come to know Christ as your Savior. Some of you here today say, well, if I die, I hope I'm going to heaven. I think I'm going to heaven. Do you know? And how do you know? It's through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, who died on the cross for your sins, paying your debt in your place. And he sent the Holy Spirit to comfort and guide and encourage you. When you accept Christ as your Savior, you get the Holy Spirit to come and get you through the tough times. You say, well, Pastor, I still have tough times. But you got Jesus. Amen. You got the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just think how rough it would be without him. Listen to that voice who's telling you, hey, stop doing that. Or start doing this. A lot of us forget that one. The Holy Spirit's there. He's not something to be afraid of. He's not to be scared there to comfort, guide, and fill us and teach us, speak to us. All those things, as I talked about, he gives us revelation and conviction. He gives us that invitation to regeneration. He indwells us. He teaches us. He makes intercession for us. He brings unity to us. He empowers us for service, and he equips us with spiritual gifts. So what do we do? We accept Jesus and the wonderful gift of the personhood of the Holy Spirit. Would you stand with me as we go to the Lord in prayer? This time of invitation, I challenge you to come as you are, to realize he is there. He loves you. He wants a relationship with you. Jesus died for you. Are you living for him? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. I pray right now your Holy Spirit, who we know is in this place, would pierce the hearts of the lost. If there's anyone in this building today that thinks they're going to heaven based on being here, I pray, Holy Spirit, you convict them. Help them to realize it's only through Jesus. Holy Spirit, speak to us and the things we need to change, those sins that we struggle with, those habits that we need to break, those things that, those things that we should be doing that we don't want to do. Speak to us. Challenge us. Fill us. 
Change us. And as I say, Lord, if there's anyone lost, let them come to know Christ. They hear Jesus come in their life, forgive me of my sins. I accept the gift of salvation through grace by faith. I pray that you use us now, Lord, to serve you. Equip us to do the work you called us to do. Use this time of decision, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us sing.